Hello, hello, AP Calculus AB, and welcome back to your review. Uh, this is day four of your targeted review, and we're into everyone's favorite particle motion. Um, particle motion sometimes gets lumped in with other free responses because with particle motion, you're always going to be given a velocity, right? And we have to remember our position, velocity, acceleration. Velocity is the derivative of position, and velocity is a rate. Of course, pretty much everything in calculus surrounds or is about rates. Um, so you're given a rate here. And sometimes that can fall into other categories. This could be your tabular question. You're given particle motion in a table. Um, this could kind of be like a rate in, rate out question, accumulation. Uh, but it's also fairly common to see one of these as a standalone question, as just particle motion. Uh, so we're going to cover the main components of it today. I've set up two free responses for you. One of them from 2017, it seems to be my go-to, I actually really liked the free responses in 2017, um, is going to be no calculator. And then the second one we're going to go through is from 2013, and it is a calculator active question. Um, as always, you should take the time right now to work through each of these questions, and when you get stuck, come back to the video. Don't listen to me drone on the whole time. Um, just focus in on yourself, see what you know how to do, and then come back together. All right, ready, set, go. Well, hopefully you're back, and hopefully you found some success. I will say that this question, this 2017 question 5, I thought was particularly tricky for particle motion, but it's a good no calculator problem. I actually see a lot of particle motions as calculator active questions because they have kind of gross numbers and they test good calculator skills. But I liked this one because it makes you remember a couple things, and I think it's on the harder side. Um, and I also believe that it's a little bit easier to practice something that's on the harder side and then do easier questions on the exam than the other way around. So here we go. Two particles this time are moving along the x-axis. We're given the position equation of particle p, and they notate it as x sub p, right? And then they're given the velocity of particle q, v sub q. So just taking stock of what we have, we have x sub p with t as our um, independent variable, t squared minus 2t plus 10. We eventually are going to need the velocity, and I'm actually going to use the room over here just so we can see what's going on. Um, and we're going to compare this, though, to our other equation I'll do in blue, which is particle q. Particle q, v sub q of t, is given by t squared minus 8t plus 15. Right? If we wanted to look at the rest of these, we know that the derivative of velocity will give us acceleration. These are all lowercase letters with capitalized subscripts down here. Um, a sub q of t, that one's easy enough, that's just 2t minus 8. Um, and then if we wanted to find the rest here, x sub p of t, we can start taking derivatives. Uh, v sub p of t, the velocity of particle p at any time t, natural log 1 over what was inside, t squared minus 2t plus 10. So everything I've written here was just the derivative of natural log. What have we not done the derivative of yet? Oh yeah, that's right, we have not done the derivative of the inside. So I do need to multiply, parentheses are, parentheses are important, by 2t minus 2. You could, of course, move that to the top, and that's probably what I'll do later on. Um, and then I'm not going to bother to find the acceleration. That just seems overly complicated. These two were very easy derivatives. It's the same reason I didn't find the antiderivative, which isn't too tricky. You'd need a plus c there. Um, but it's my guess that they probably won't have you take the derivative for acceleration because you'd have to use the quotient rule. And maybe we'll do the antiderivative, but we'll get to it when it comes. So let's begin. For 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 8, when is particle p moving to the left? Well, we do need to remember that most of the equations we see with particle motion are vectors, where the vectors tell us two characteristics of the particle. In particular, the velocity tells us how fast the particle is moving, that's the number involved in velocity, and also which direction the particle is moving, and that is the plus or the minus, the sign there. So velocity controls which direction the particle is moving. So let's go ahead and see when particle p is moving to the left. We need the velocity equation, so I'll write that over here. v sub p of t is equal to 2t minus 2 divided by t squared minus 2t plus 10. All right. 
moving to the left, well, the easiest way to determine where a particle is moving to the left is first to determine where's the particle stopped. So to find where the particle is stopped, we need to go through and determine where is the velocity zero. We should also determine where the velocity is undefined. And um, we're going to go ahead and have a little side conversation about that shortly. But let's start with the easy one. Where is this zero? Well, this is a fraction. Fractions become zero when the numerator is zero. So really, we just need to set 2t minus 2 equal to zero. Add 2, divide by 2 to find t is 1. So we know that the particle stops at a time of 1. But does the particle not exist anywhere? Right, it seems possible that this could be equal to zero. However, I'll do this in blue, um, when you set this equal to zero, right, because if the denominator of a fraction becomes zero, then the fraction is divided by zero, it does not exist. Um, you look at this and go, oh, I know how to solve this, I have to factor. But sadly, this does not factor with nice integer values. And so you're like, drat, well, if I can't factor, what do I do? Well, your other two options are completing the square, which you should know how to do, um, or you could use the quadratic formula. Either of those are fine. Um, I'll remind you of the quadratic formula quickly and then tell you why we really don't need to write this part. Um, but if we use the quadratic formula, it automatically isolates t, right? It's that negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, all divided by 2 a. The important part of the quadratic formula we need to focus in on is the interior of the square root. Sometimes this is called the discriminant. Uh, the discriminant here is going to give us 4 minus 40, which is negative 36. If you apply the square root to that discriminant, you get not a real answer, which means there is no real value of t that will cause this equation to equal 0. Now, I was not super concerned about this in doing any of this work for a couple reasons. First, and this one is just experience, um, if you have a particle's equation, they're not going to give you a time, on this interval at least, where the particle's velocity does not exist. That is really hard to, I think, quantify in the real world. Why would the particle's velocity stop existing? Uh, so I was pretty confident that that wouldn't zero. I got even more confident when I set the equation equal to zero and found it didn't factor because there is never supposed to be a time where you have to use the quadratic formula to solve an equation. If it doesn't factor, um, then you're probably doing something wrong. And so as soon as I saw it didn't factor, I was even more convinced that there wasn't a solution, a real number solution to this. But then I just checked it just in case, and there are no real number solutions here. So the only critical point we need is this guy. You didn't even have to check the denominator. And I'll tell you when my students have done this one in the past, that most of them haven't even remembered to check the denominator, which is not good. But those that did were like, I don't know how to solve it, so I'm just going to run with this critical point, And they still received full points. That's all they needed. So what do we do from here? Uh, we go ahead and we create a quick sign chart. We want to look at the velocities of particle p on the interval from 0 to 8. Found 1 creates a velocity of 0. And then we just try values. Now, we determined that this doesn't have real zeros. For a quadratic to not have real zeros, either the parabola, this guy, is above the x-axis going up, so it's all positive, or below the x-axis going down, all negative. And it's a really easy check to see which is which. Just substitute in 0, and you'll see that's 10. That means our parabola is all positive. Okay, so if the entire denominator is positive, then in order to find the signs here, we just need to look at the numerator. Let's try something like 1 half. Half of 2 is 1, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, so we get a negative value. If I try something like 2, 4 minus 2 is 2, that is a positive value. And now we have our sign chart, which tells us first the particle is moving to the left, and then the particle is moving to the right. All right, so when is the particle moving to the left? Uh, the particle P is moving. I always like to restate the question. Well, you know you're getting the verbiage correct. Is moving left on 0 to 1. Closed or open brackets doesn't matter. Because, how did we know that? Oh, because V sub P of T was less than 0. Could you have said because the velocity of particle P is negative? Sure, that's totally fine as well. What do you have to have for this problem? 
you have to have shown that you set the velocity equal to zero and you found a critical point. You have to show those two steps. Have to, have to. You can't just find t equals one. You have to show those two steps. It's a setup and an answer. Then you need a conclusion. Everything else, well, you sh I guess you should probably find the derivative too since they didn't get the, give that to you. Everything else, not necessary. For 0 to 8, find all times during which the particles travel in the same direction. Well, we already have a pretty picture of when this particle travels left versus right. Let's do the same thing for particle q. So we know that the velocity, really didn't want me to switch to blue there, the velocity of particle q is actually given to us in this equation. Um, and that was, or this problem, t squared minus 8t plus 15. We do need to set this equal to 0. And this guy should, I hope, be factorable. Otherwise, there are just going to be, there's going to be no critical points. But this one does factor. Minus 5, minus 3, right? Multiplies to make 15, adds to make negative 8. And so we find 3 and 5. Excellent. Now what? Oh yeah, let's actually do a double sign chart. I think that'll probably be pretty useful here. Um, so we have this guy. Over here, we're going from 0 to 8. We know that 3 causes, let's just look at the velocity of particle q down here, causes this velocity to become 0, as does 5. And then we know that 1 causes the velocity of particle p to become 0. We already know here are these signs. And actually, sometimes it helps students to subdivide this like so, so we can see all the different intervals where they match up here. And then we have velocity of particle q. All right, well, I think we should probably just try a few values. From 0 to 3, let's try 2. I like to try it in the factored form, I think it's easier. We get negative 3 times negative 1, which is a positive. Or if we divide this out, both of these are positive. From 3 to 5, let's try 4. 4 minus 5 is negative 1 times positive 1, that's a negative. And 5 to 8, you can probably guess what happens. Positive times a positive is a positive. One of the particles traveling in the same direction, well, I see two spots. Traveling to the right from 1 to 3, and traveling to the right from 5 to 8. How do we write this down? Well, um, let's see, something like travel, same direction, on 1 to 3, and 5 to 8, because v sub p of t and v sub q of t have the same signs. You could have said that they were both positive as well, but same idea. All right, moving on through. Find the acceleration of particle q. Did we find acceleration earlier? Oh, we did. It's 2t minus 8. OK, that's good to show. So we know that v prime sub q of t is the acceleration sub q of t. I always like to show this connection so that we don't just whip out a, a of t from nowhere. They're like, how do you find acceleration? Oh, it's the derivative of velocity. And I've already forgotten. It was 2t minus 8. Excellent. Okay, We want the acceleration at a time of 2. So that is just the acceleration of particle q at a time of 2 uh, becomes 2 times 2 minus 8, which is negative 4. All right, now don't do what so many students do but, and look at that and say, oh, acceleration is negative, speed is decreasing. It's all about that vector thing. We need to realize that an acceleration of negative 4 is like someone is pushing you, let's say, to the left with a force of force. They're pushing you left. Now, two things could be happening. If they're pushing you to the left and you're already moving to the left, that's going to speed you up, right? You're moving in one direction. Someone's pushing behind you. Imagine you're on a bicycle. You're going to go faster. However, if they're pushing to the left, but you're trying to go to the right, let's say that they're pushing you and you don't want to go that way and you're pushing back against them, now you're certainly slowing down, not speeding up. And so what you need to consider in addition to acceleration is also the velocity at 2. And our velocity equation, we know is that t squared minus 8t plus 15. We actually already know the velocity at 2. The velocity at 2 is positive. Um, I'm going to find it anyways. And I just made a boo-boo. We definitely don't want to say of 2 <coughs> and then have t's in here. That's not true. The velocity at 2 is not an equation. The velocity at 2 
is the velocity equation with 2 substituted in. 4 and 15 is 19. 19 minus 16 is 3. All right, how do we conclude here? Well, we would say something like the speed is decreasing at t equals 2 because a sub q of 2 and v sub q of 2 have opposite signs. And that's the most important part, that they are opposite. It doesn't matter what their numbers are, right? We want to know that 1 is negative and 1 is positive. Um, you might not even get the credit here if you said a sub q of 2 equals negative 4 and v sub q of 2 equals 3 because that doesn't show you understand why. You're like, we gave some numbers, but the numbers don't matter. It's all about the signs. Just saying they have opposite signs would be good to go. Find the position of particle Q the first time it changes direction. Let's see, particle Q. Uh, let's look at the path of particle Q. Well, it looks to me like particle Q is moving to the right until 3, and then it moves to the left, and then it moves to the right. So when does it first change direction? Particle Q first changes direction at 3. So we're going to say particle Q first changes direction at t equals 3. So they want to know the position of Q when it first changes direction. So essentially what are we looking for here? We are trying to find the position of particle Q at 3. How do we do that? Well, we have the velocity equation to get from velocity to position. It's got to be our antiderivative. So let's take a look. We need to integrate the velocity of particle Q. But we usually like these definite integrals. You can do this with an indefinite integral, but I think it's easier to just do that fundamental theorem each time. Um, I'll, I'll show you both, though. I think we have the time for today. Uh, we hopefully know something about the position of particle Q. We do know something. Is the position of x equals 5 at a time of 0. So that means that when we substitute in 0, we get an output of 5. All right, that means then what we need to integrate from 0 to 3 and we know through the fundamental theorem, that will be the position at 3 minus the position at 0. Rearranging, if we're interested in the position at 3, we need to add the position of 0 on over. And we also might as well substitute in our equation here. Um, our equation, t squared minus 8t plus 15 dt equals the position at 3. We know that this is 5. How do we do this? Well, two ways to evaluate a definite integral. Either you're finding the area under the curve, or we use our fundamental theorem and we find the antiderivative. Okay? So antiderivative isn't bad. 1 third t cubed minus 4 t squared plus 15 out of room t from 0 to 3 equals x sub q of 3. And let's finish this off from here. 5 plus, watch those parentheses. I actually like to keep the brackets and substitute in the 3. You can do as much mental math here as you would like. Uh, 3 cubed is 27. A third of 27 is 9. 3 squared is 9. 9 times 4 is 36. Plus 45. That's the first one. Minus, and I love to put the minus in here, even though I can tell everything becomes 0. Um, I think it's really useful to substitute in 0 here just to remind you of what that fundamental theorem is. And that's going to equal the position at 3. Now remember, this being a timed test, if you get to this point and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to simplify everything, you can stop right here. That is acceptable as an answer. It's kind of a gross looking answer, but that is actually probably the best answer because now you don't have to worry about making mistakes when you simplify. Okay. If you aren't satisfied with that, you can simplify it down. What's it going to be? 45 minus 36, that is 9. 9 and 9 is 18. 18 and 5 looks like 23, I think. So you could say the position is 23. Nothing wrong with that. I did promise you, though, a second way to do this problem. And let's look at the second way right now. The second way is you can take the integral of this equation, t squared minus 8t plus 15, straight away. And the antiderivative, 1 third t cubed minus 4t squared plus 15t 
plus c. You have to remember the plus c if you don't have those limits. So I said equals, but this really is equal to x sub q of t, the position that's any time t. Now, before we find the position at 3, we need to use our initial condition. This is kind of like solving those differential equations, right? Where our initial condition was at a time of 0, we're at a position of 5. So the output is 5, and the input is 0, which is pretty easy math to do, I think, I hope. I think we find then that just c is 5. So now we know that the actual overall equation, 1 3rd t cubed minus 4t squared plus 15t, has a plus 5 at the end in this scenario. Then what do we have to do to finish it off? Oh yeah, we have to go through and actually substitute in our 3, just like we did over here. So then this just becomes, this was again 9, right? Minus 36 plus 45 plus 5. And notice the plus 5 is still here as well. Second way to do it, if you like the plus C more than manipulating, that's fine. But I guarantee there's going to be a time on the calculator active section, either free response or multiple choice, where you will have to use this method. Um, there is rarely a time where you have to use this method, but it does occur. All right, last part. At a time of four, is the particle Q moving towards the origin or away from the origin? Hmm, justify that answer. Okay, well, I think there's a few things we need to know here. Let's at least figure out which way the particle is moving. So at a time of four, uh, let's figure out the velocity, I think. So let's find V sub Q of four. That's going to be 4 squared minus 8 times 4 plus 15. It's 16 minus 32 plus 15. 15 and 16 is 31. 31 minus 32 is negative 1. So what does that tell us? It tells us that at a time of 4, the particle is moving to the left. Now we need to be very careful here, and I'll give you two scenarios, and then I'll erase this. Um, if this is the origin, right, over origin or 0, and the particle is moving left, you might say, well, of course, if the particle is here and you're moving left, you're moving towards the origin, and you're not wrong. But what if the particle was already to the left of the origin and you're moving left? Then you'd be moving away from the origin. So not only do we need to know which way the particle is moving, we also need to know, that's right, where the particle is located. Now, where is the particle located? Well, actually, we can cheat this one a little bit uh, because we just did all the math up here, and I did the second one that I said you wouldn't use too often. We're going to use it right now. I'm going to take this equation, which works for any um, time t, and I'm just going to go ahead and say, let's find the position of the particle at 4. So 1 third, 4 cubed is 64, I'm pretty confident. Um, 4 squared, is that 64 as well? Um, 4 times 15 is 60, plus 5 more. Looks a little daunting because of that 1 third, but I think we'll do okay because this is 65. Minus 64 is 1, so we get 64 thirds minus 1, or 64 thirds minus 3 over 3, 61 thirds. That doesn't go in nicely, but what does it tell us? It tells us that at a time of 4, the particle is located at a positive position, or again, we picture that number line, here's zero. The particle is located over here at 61 thirds, positive, so it's to the right of the origin, but the particle is moving left, so we conclude with something like this. As v sub q of 4 is less than zero, the particle is moving left. As x sub q of 4 is greater than 0, the particle is moving towards the origin, the end. Whew. Definitely a lot of math by hand here, um, and a lot of different directions. That was really our main focus, moving left, moving right, moving left, moving right. Um, and I really liked this one because it gets you into the fundamental theorem of calculus, has you compare two different particles. Great way to go. Now, get that calculator ready because we're going on to part two. This one gives us a velocity equation, just a single velocity this time, very nice. And they're telling us it moves along a linear vertical path. So this time our particle is moving up and down. 
So we have the origin here, maybe think of sea level or zero degrees or something like that. You can either move up or move down, which is why they've called our equation y of t for position, because you're located along the y-axis instead of the x. It's known that at a time of zero, you're located 10 feet, meters, miles, degrees above zero. Part A. Find all values t for which the speed of the particle is 2, looking only between 2 and 4. All right, well, we have three equations. Okay. We know that velocity controls the speed, but it also controls the direction, and that will become important so, uh, shortly. So what do we need to do? Well, we are looking for t, which means we don't know t in the equation over here. We're trying to find t. What do we know? We know 2. 2 is a speed which is pretty much like a velocity. Now you have a couple options here. You could write 2 equals negative 2 plus t squared. I don't even want to write the rest of that. And you could write all that out. However, this equation has a name, v of t. So I would suggest instead of writing all that out, I'm just crossing it out. They can't read it if you cross it out. I'm just going to write 2 equals velocity. And then we want to solve. Now I've shown the setup, very important. We also need to show the answer. How do I solve 2 equals an equation? You might say, well, we could try algebra. But they've picked this equation purposely so that using algebra is probably not going to be very effective. The giveaway, though, is that this is calculator active. So we're going to use our calculator to solve this problem, to solve where 2 is equal to velocity. Now, I've already set up my velocity equation in my calculator right here. I messed around with the window, went from 0 to 5, so negative 1 to 6. I'm just going to go ahead and hit tab and graph the equation 2, hopefully. Maybe I'm not. There we go. Okay. We're only looking between 2 and 4 on this, so I'm going to adjust the window really quickly. Uh, window, window settings. We're just going to go between 2 and 4, breaking my own rule. But either way, you can clearly see there's only one intersection. Menu, analyze graph. Let's find that intersection right here. And I'm certainly not going to trust that 3.13. We're going to hit the plus a few times. There we go. 3.127. Most of my students usually end up getting this point. But this problem is actually worth two points, or was worth two points in 2013. One point was the setup and the answer here, but those aren't all the answers. Because what we found here is when we substitute in 3.127 for all these values of t, we get an answer of positive 2. And you're like, isn't that what we want? Well, sure, that is when the particle is moving to the right at a speed of 2. But what would you say if I set up an equation negative 2 equals v of t? This is going to find us a value of t where when you substitute it in, the answer becomes negative 2. And isn't that just the particle moving to the left but at a speed of 2? And that's oftentimes why you hear that speed is the absolute value of velocity. If you take the absolute value of either of these, it strips away the sign and just gives the speed. And so we do actually need to solve this equation as well. So I'm going to go through. Um, we're going to switch this up. Tab. We're going to take this up. There we go. We're going to take this up and make this a negative 2. Now our intersection is down below. Analyze graph intersection. And we have our other answer, of course, remembering to hit that plus to get all three decimals, 3.473. There we go. This would get you both points. However, you might remember that there is a faster way to solve an equation equal to both positive and a negative. And the faster way is instead of having two different equations, we can say let's find the absolute value of velocity and just set that equal to positive 2. Because the way that you solve absolute value equations is you take the interior and you set 1 equal to the negative and 1 equal to the positive. So this is just really working backwards. When you have negative and positive, you can just do one equation. What would this one equation look like? Well, I already have this guy, which we're going to turn into 2. I'm going to go up and turn off f1 of x. I don't want to see that guy anymore. And then I want to graph the absolute value of my velocity equation. 
to do that, notice the absolute value button is actually hiding next to the 9 down here. I call it the quick key. Right? We have this guy right here, absolute value. We want to do the absolute value of f1 of x. Hit enter. Now we have the absolute value. And do you see both of the intersection points here? Those two intersection points, we already know their values. We found them before. They are going to be 3.127 and 3.473. And there we go. This way is a little more efficient. This one doesn't take too much longer, but you must remember for speed to find both the positive and negative velocities. Okay, part B. Write an expression involving an integral that gives the position y of t. Use this expression to find the position of the particle at a time t equals 5. I think I'm actually going to work backwards here. I'm more comfortable finding positions at this point than I am writing equations. So let's start with that. I want to find the position at a time of 5. We know we have velocity. In order to turn velocity into position, we integrate. We know 5 is important. What else did they tell us in this problem? Uh, we know that y of 0 is 10. This is our t. This is our distance. So we want to go from 0 to 5. This is going to find us the position y of 5 minus y of 0. Moving this around a bit, if I wanted to find the position of the particle at 5, that's this guy, we need to add y of 0 over to our integral. There we go. We know y of 0 is 10. How do we find the integral? Well, we just use our calculator. Don't bother writing out the equation v of t. That's already in our calculator. We just use the calculus portion of our scratch pads. So we're going to jump over here. Menu, calculus. We need the integral from 0 to 5 of my velocity equation, not absolute value, just my velocity equation, f1 of x dx. And there we go, negative 19.207 negative 19.207 equals y of 5. Therefore, we can say that y of 5 equals, and again, you could stop here if you wanted, but since you have a calculator, I think the rest of this isn't too bad, right? We just need to add on 10. 10 is a positive. Uh, negative 9.207. I guess we probably didn't need a calculator for that. Awkward, but that's okay. There we go. Now, they asked us to write an integral involve, or write an expression that gives the position y of t. Well, let's just reverse engineer this, but instead of using 5, let's use t, right? This found us y of 5, so let's say y of t instead of y of 5 is equal to y of 0 plus the integral from 0 not to 5 anymore, but to t. And then do you remember this dummy variable thing where I don't want to write v of t dt? That's too many t's going on. We want to change that variable and maybe just call it v of x dx. And we should probably go a little bit further and remember that y of 0 is 10. Um, and I think that'll be okay. And then check it. Does it work? If you wanted to find y of 5 and you replaced every t in this equation with 5, would that find the correct answer? Well, certainly. That is exactly what we did over here. So by working backwards, we were able to come up with this nice equation or expression, and I think we're set. Part C. Find all times t at which the particle changes direction from 0 to 5. Justify your answer. We did something like this before. Um, we, in order to find where a particle changes direction, we need to determine where the particle stops moving. Our particle stops moving when the velocity, which incorporates speed, is 0. So this is showing I want to find where the velocity equation is 0. This is my setup, then we need our answer. But one really nice way to solve an equation, not by hand, um, is to use your calculator to find the zeros, and that's what I'm going to do right now. So we're going to pull this up, go back to our graphing screen. Uh, we have a few things to change around. My window is going to not be right anymore, so I'm going to go from negative 1 to 6. I want to make sure that we have the right window settings there. Um, and then I also need to get rid of that absolute value guy. Get rid of 2. And of course, turn our equation back on. I said on. There we go. All right, then we need to find the zeros. From 0 to 5, I only see two zeros here. Shouldn't be too terrible to find. Analyze graph, let's find that 0. 
Never trust that. We need more just in case. There we go. And then we'll find one more. Menu, analyze graph zero. There's the other, of course, looking for more decimals. 0 0.536. 0 0.536. And 3 point, whatever the other one was, uh, 317. Great. We found where the particle stops. But does the particle actually change direction there? Well, I think one of the easiest ways to check that is just to create a quick little sign chart. This will come in handy almost certainly later. Going from 0 to 5, 0 0.536 caused the velocity to be 0, as did 3.317. Let's find those signs of velocity. If we jump back here, the sign of velocity, since this is the velocity, is just dictated by above or below the x-axis. Below is negative, then positive, Now that we have a nice picture of what the particle is doing on each interval, we can answer the question. Find all times t at which the particle changes direction. Well, the particle happens to change direction at each of the critical points. That's not always the case, though. right? If we had been looking at a graph where instead of it going up, down, and up, something like this, right? what if instead the graph went down and back up like so? this would not be a spot where the particle changes direction because the velocity was positive and then stayed positive. So you need to be very careful. And so our justification here can't be because v of t is 0 at these time values, then that's where the particle changes direction. We don't know that. We need to make sure that v of t changes sign. This is kind of like that second derivative, right? With inflection points, we need to see a change of sign. This is one of those weird times with critical points. We need that as well. So conclusion, uh, the particle changes direction at t equals those two values, right? Good, uh, because v of t changes sine. And that would be fine. I'm just somewhat, I really like to cover my bases here. So I'd say change of sine at t equals, and then I'm going to rewrite those. Now, if you're running short on time, you'd get away with just ending your sentence right here. No problem at all. But I'm just very, very clear. And I'm trying not to say change of sine there there is a little vague for me. Again, you'd still probably be fine, but it's always best to be specific. All right, we're jumping down to part D. Um, I really like this question. I actually altered it from what the original question was. This one asks about the average velocity of the particle and the average acceleration. And I think it does a really, really nice job of illustrating the two different ways we know to find an average. And to remind you of those two different ways. I'm going to write these up here, and I'm not saying which way is which to start. Let's see if we can figure that out. Um, we should know that one way to find an average, we usually hear this with the average rate of change or the slope of the secant, or you might even call it the slope formula, um, is if we do the slope from 0 to 5. And people might say, oh, average velocity, that probably means I would do something like v of 5 minus v of 0 divided by 5 minus 0. And that is certainly one way in calculus we know how to find the average, the average rate of change. The other way that we know how to find the average, though, is through our, quote, average value theorem, end quote. And so that's where we do our 1 divided by b minus a times the integral from a to b of v of t dt. We're going to try to compare what each of these are finding. We'll use the calculator to do the heavy lifting for us. Um, but we're going to compare them in terms of units. Now, I know there are no units in this problem, but we can make up our own. We've been doing enough velocities these days. We can fill this in. Let's maybe say that our velocity is going to be in our usual American miles per hour. And then that, of course, makes time in hours. Well, if we're finding the velocity at 5 and the velocity at 0, that means my units for the numerator are going to be in miles per hour. And then 5 and 0 are the inputs, which means they're in hours. And so when we do the final math, we're going to get units of miles per hour per hour. 
So ask yourself, we know this is an average, is this an average velocity or an average acceleration? And looking at the answer, those units, you should recognize miles per hour per hour or miles per hour squared. These are acceleration units. So this difference quotient, right, division of two differences, um, is finding us the average acceleration. Okay, but what about the other guy? Well, for the other one, we will again look at units. Um, Unit-wise, we know V of T, we already said, is in terms of miles per hour. DT is the difference in times. The difference in time will be in hours. And you'll notice if you multiply those, the hours cancel and just give you miles. So at first glance, it seems like this expression just tells you something about miles. But we need to remember this 1 divided by 5 minus 0, or 1 fifth. 5 and 0, as we saw before, have units. Those are in hours. 1 is just 1 over. It's a placeholder. That doesn't have any units. So we might think of it as 1 over hours. And so when you multiply here, you will have final units of miles per hour. What we're doing then, to think about this in a different way, is we are doing the antiderivative of velocity, which is position. That's where the miles comes in. But then we're taking this answer and we're dividing it by hours. That's like we're finding a derivative. In fact, another way you might see this written, if we use position, we used y for that in this problem, you might see this. This antiderivative is our fundamental theorem, y of 5 minus y of 0 divided by 5 minus 0. In fact, that's our average rate of change from before, but now we're using units of miles and hours, and it will give us the answer over here. So this um, difference quotient is actually the exact same thing as this average value theorem, just using a different equation. But we're using velocity because that's what we're given, and we do again need to realize there are two different averages. We need to know that if you use the average value theorem, that it finds something about the function in here. This tells us the average of velocity. If you use your difference quotient or your slope formula, it finds the average derivative of this function, so the average acceleration. We should probably go ahead and actually find those values, but the nice part is we already have this function stored in our calculator, so it goes very quickly. Um, we're just going to switch on back over there and um, you probably already have the integral written, but let's do the fraction first. So we have our fraction, right? And then it was f1 of, well, I think it was 5 minus f1 of 0 over 5 minus 0. If I hit enter, you'll notice that my calculator is trying to be overly helpful. That silly cast calculator is giving me an exact answer. It's like, hey, look, look how nice I was. I gave you an answer. You don't have to round. Um, yeah, I would actually rather have the rounded answer. So when you have this written, don't forget that you can always do control and then enter to get that approximately. And we'll take that nice rounded answer of negative 8.2697. We'll jot that down over here. Negative purple 8.2697. There's that negative, and we're good to go. All right, the average velocity, though, we'll do the same thing. Uh, we'll get that fraction rolling first. 1 over 5 minus 0 times, and then we need that integral, menu, calculus, integral, and we're going from 0 to 5 of f1 of x dx, and there we go, negative 3.841. Hopefully that gives you a nice rundown of the differences between your two ways to find those averages. And we're going to move on to our last two problems. The first one says find the total distance the particle has traveled over a time interval, but uh, your paper will hopefully be the updated version where it's not only the total distance, they also want you to find the displacement of the particle from 0 to 5. I thought if we compared the two averages, we should compare the two different types of integrals we do with particle motion as well. Um, let's go ahead and think about, and I mentioned integrals because these are distance and displacement. We'll talk more in depth shortly. Um, we know we're going to integrate. So let's just start by integrating velocity from 0 to 5 and see if we can determine what that's actually finding for us. 
Well, there are two ways to find an integral. One is using our calculation portion by finding the antiderivative and substituting in 0 and 5. But the way your calculator does it, and the, way, the other way we can think about integration, is to look at areas. So when we are finding the integral from 0 over to 5, somewhere over here, I see three main areas that will go into that calculation. First, you will sum up this negative area down here. It looks almost like a little triangle. Then you'll sum up this positive area until 3.317. And then from there to 5, you have this giant negative area at the end. But what do those areas represent? Well, these areas actually represent the distance you travel in one direction or the other. So we're starting somewhere. We don't know exactly where we start. Maybe it's given to us in the problem, but that's not relevant for this. We're starting at some specific point, and then because we're accumulating negative area underneath the velocity graph, this means I'm moving to the left. So I move some distance to the left. How far? Well, it's this area. So I'm starting somewhere, and I move to the left. Then I move a huge distance, look at this positive area, a huge distance to the right. So not only, do, so at first I move to the left, when I move to the right, notice that this area right here would probably cancel it out. So this is about where I'd be back to where I started. But now I'm moving to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right because of all this positive area. And then what happens? Well now I move to the left a decent amount. I don't know how big this area is compared to the other one, but we move back to the left. If you wanted to put numbers to it, I don't know, maybe we move to the right like one unit. I'm sorry, move to the left one unit. And then maybe I move to the right 10 units. So now if I move to the left one, so let's say negative one, but then to the right 10, now I've technically moved to the right nine overall. And then we have more negatives over here. Let's say this is negative eight. Nine minus eight is one. What we've just done here is found the displacement. If I move to the right 1, nope, to the left 1, to the right 10, and to the left 9, if you add those up, negative 8 plus 10 minus 1 is going to give us 1. What that means is wherever I started here, I finish one unit to the right of where I started. In fact, let's find that exact displacement and see if we can interpret it. So we have to do that menu calculus integral. We've done this a few times. In fact, I probably should have just copied this down from earlier, but oh well, we've already come too far. dx. Let's see what we got. Oh wow, we got a really negative answer. So what that means is when we tallied up those three areas, overall the final answer was negative. And it means that we ended up negative 19.207 units to the left of wherever we started. Or another way to phrase that is the difference in position from where you were at 0 to where you were at 5 is negative 19 or is 19 units to the left. Okay, so this is known as our displacement. This is that negative 19 point, I don't actually remember what it was, I'm guessing 207, but I could be wrong. Oh, I got it right, 207. What is the difference between displacement and total distance? Well, total distance doesn't want anything to cancel out. We want to include, and I'm again making this up, this negative 1, and we want to be able to add it to the 10 up here. So I don't want this to be negative 1 plus 10 to get 9. I want this to be 1 plus 10 more to get a total distance of 11 that we've traveled. 1 to the left, 10 to the right. And then I want all of this to be positive as well so that we can sum up all three positive areas and see how far we traveled on our journey. And the easiest way to do that, hopefully you remember, um, is an integral again, but of the absolute value of velocity. That will cause our graph of velocity to be above the x-axis, which means when we sum up the areas, all of the areas will be positive. Um, and I think we'll be all right there. So I'm just going to try and copy this down. Let's see if I can be efficient here. Um, and then I can probably do shift and then highlight everything over here. A little bit trickier with a pen. Normally I just press it and hold. And then I wonder if I can just do the absolute value button here and then hit enter on it. Ha, look at that. There we go. Right, if you highlight something and then perform another operation, it'll keep that and apply the new operation. And we come up with an answer of 40.478. So again, comparing these. 
from a time of 0 to 5, at 0 you start somewhere, at 5 you finish 19 units to the left of where you started at 0. You've been displaced negative 19.207 units. However, on route of being displaced to the left 19 units, you actually traveled 40 steps. So maybe I traveled to the left like 2 steps, and then to the right like 15 steps, and then to the left, you know, a super far amount to bring us up to 40. So comparing those two, very important to know the difference. Let's go ahead and move on to our last problem for the day. What is the highest vertical position the particle achieves over that time interval? Well, highest vertical, highest is always going to mean an absolute max or absolute min. Absolute max in this case because it says highest vertical position. We are trying to maximize y of t, the position at some time. We have a couple ways to do this. First thing I want to check is a sign chart, which I made earlier. Bit of a bummer, there's two critical points. What so looks like we'll be doing our candidates test here. However, just to check this with our critical points, we decrease in position, increase in position, and decrease. What that tells me then is that the absolute max has to be at either 0 or 3.317. Do you still need to check the other two? Yes, you do, unless you can write a couple sentences convincing someone why you don't have to check those. And by the time you write the sentences, you might as well have just checked all three of them. So here we go. We have our t value and our y of t value. Uh, we had four of these, 0, 5, and then the others, 5, 3, 6, and 3.317. There we go. Uh, do we know any of these so far? Let's jump back up to earlier. Um, use this expression to find the position of the particle at t equals 5 half. We found 5, negative 9.207. And I think they actually gave us y of 0 is 10. So 10 and negative 9.207. In fact, I'm going to rewrite that equation from earlier too. I think that'll help us. It says to find any value, y of any t, we do 10 plus the integral from 0 to 5 of y of t dt. That's nice. We can just use our calculator, I think, and copy and paste. Just a couple reminders with the calculator, though. Uh, we want to make sure, if we're doing calculations with a decimal, that we use the most accurate version of that decimal possible. So to do that, I'm going to go through and quickly, in my graph, save these guys or store them for different values. Good practice to get into. Right, we discussed how to do this on the 84 earlier, so I imagine you can make your way through. I'm just going to hover, click once, control, store. I'll store this one as A, and then I will store, actually, the, the nice brief pause here. Sometimes when you go to store it as something, it'll say error. It's already stored as something else, which sometimes your calculator has issues with this, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so one way to check to see what's stored on your calculator is if you go to menu, actions, and then you can either check recall definition, and if you do that, that's just for a function. So right now it says you only have one thing defined, that's F1, that's my graph, right? Um, however, the other thing you can do is if you want to make sure you don't have anything stored, and I'd honestly suggest you do this the day of your test, I would go down and I would do clear A to Z. What that's going to do is it's going to delete anything stored under the letter A and B and C and so on and so forth. So I'll clear all of those, and now you shouldn't have an issue storing anything if you did in the past. So same thing, click once, control, store. I'll store this one as A, and I'm also going to store this one as B. Control, store, B. Excellent. Now that we have those, we can use our formula to find the rest of it. Our formula looks just like this. I don't know why I wrote a 5 there, and I decided to pretty much do everything wrong. That was very exciting. Uh, 0 to t of y of x dx. I did that wrong earlier. I just copied it wrong. Oh, nope, just copied it wrong. Very exciting. Okay, so let's get rolling. We need to do 10 plus the integral from 0 to 5 of f1 of x dx, but not 5. Oh my gosh, Mr. Grant. Let's do it to a first. Good. 9.402. We can record that. 9.402. 
and the last one is the same thing, but I'm just going to make this be. 20.038. Excuse me, I said switch screens. There we go. 20.038. We're looking for the highest vertical position. That's that guy right there. Highest vertical position. So we are pretty much done at this point. Um, I always like to check. I'm curious if it would make a difference if I did 0.536 versus A and 3.317 instead of B. So I'm going to quickly check those. Um, so this one was 0.536. Let's see if it's any different than the 9.402. 40250, they look exactly the same to me. And then I wonder about this one. The only time that they ever really cause issues is if you're doing a ton of area, like it's exponential, so it would change just a huge amount. Um, usually it doesn't matter, but I always like to be exact, especially if I have the time. This one changed uh, five, six decimal places out, right? I mean, you're like, oh, that's pretty negligible. And you're right, it is pretty negligible. I think even when, like, NASA sends rockets to the moon, I think they only use pi out to, like, six digits or something. So by the, if you're changing out here, that's such a negligible amount. It doesn't really matter, but should you be as exact as possible? Yeah, good habit to get into. All right, so while you're writing down your three tips, tricks, and techniques for today, I'm going to run through our um, conclusion at the top. And hopefully you found this helpful. So we need to know that our ladder or our tiers of particle motion go position, derivative to velocity, derivative to acceleration. Working backwards, of course, are antiderivatives. Velocity is a vector. So if you get something like negative 7, that means both you're moving with a speed of 7, but also to the left. Speed is the absolute value of velocity, and when you have to find how fast a particle moves, you need to set your velocity equation both to the positive speed and the negative, or the fast way is just set the absolute value of velocity. You can solve that using your calculator, that's most common. Particle is speeding up when velocity and acceleration have the same sign, either they're both positive or both negative. Do a sub double sign chart or just substitute in each value. Total distance is the absolute value of velocity, but displacement is how far away you are currently to where you started, and that's just by integrating velocity. You are certainly going to have to manipulate a velocity equation using the fundamental theorem to find other positions. If you want to find where a particle is at rest, you set the velocity to zero and make a sign chart. If you want to find which direction a particle or an interval where a particle is moving left or right, you do the same thing here. You set velocity equal to zero, make a sign chart, and look at the different intervals. To determine if two particles are moving towards or away from each other, not only do you need to know where they're currently located, that's the position, you also need to know which way they're moving. And if you want the average velocity, well, if you have v of t, then you use the average value theorem, 1 over b minus a times the integral of v of t. However, if you have the position, then you use that slope of the endpoints, difference quotient, secant line, average rate of change, whatever sounds good to you. So thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you found this really helpful for your review of particle motion, and we'll have you back next class for our next targeted review.